Hi, how are you? This is Experiments in Digital Storytelling. I am Maddie Barbara Balkelman and I work with Culture Hub. Um, Experiments in Digital Storytelling is a new initiative between Culture Hub and La Mama um, to work with artists, creative technologists, and more to discover the potential of emerging technology to create meaningful, uh, meaningful stories and meaningful experiences for folks online, um, particularly online in this moment. This was um, supposed to be an in-person experience in the downstairs at La Mama, um, but you know, due to the current situation in the world that everyone is experiencing, we had to bring it online. It's kind of crazy that we have programming that can make a somewhat seamless transition transition to an online uh, venue. So that's really exciting. And um, it's cool to be working with people who are already here. Um, so this is Experiments in Digital Storytelling. This exactly is an open rehearsal with Double Eye Studios. Double Eye Studios is a, a group that's been working in virtual reality to create theater. Um, they're, we're supporting their work within this program and um, what we're about to see is an open rehearsal. Uh, it's not a show, it's not a performance, it's sort of an opening up into process. Um, they were in our studio back in August uh, working on Love Seat, which you'll learn a little bit more about soon, which premiered at the Venice Biennale. And right now we're supporting them as they venture into a new, new storytelling world uh, called Pandora X. Um, so this is a little teaser basically and we'll be showing a, a more fleshed out piece of the of the of the theater work itself in May. Um, this this thing that we're doing here right now is going to be happening in VR chat, which is sort of the theatrical venue that they're working in. We are connecting with their technologists, actors, our team, all remotely using Live Lab, which is our own experimental software that we've been developing for networked performance, collaboration amongst artists and audiences. Um, so yeah, thanks for being with us. I know it's either morning, afternoon, or night, wherever you are, I hope. I hope you're doing all right. Um, and without further ado, I will welcome Kira Benzing, who is the director of Double Eye Studios. Thank you, Maddie. Thank you, entire Culture Hub team. And thank you, audience that is joining us from wherever you may be, hopefully safe within the comfort of your homes. Um, I love, Maddie, you used the word process. Today is really about process. We're going to share a little bit about our process we are creating new processes together with you, our digital and virtual audiences. We're going to make yet an even bigger expanded process. It's really new territory. Um, we love working in virtual reality. We've been working with this medium for a while now. And I'll just give an overview of what we're going to do with you all today over the course of the next hour. We are going to run two scenes from an existing production. We're going to do an interactive experiment with those of you on Facebook, you can be adding comments in, and we're actually gonna work them into a kind of live audience collective experiment. And then we're gonna show you something that we're working on this production of Pandora X, which is really new. We have just begun writing it maybe even as, as old as a week ago. So we're really gonna show you something just hot off the presses and it will be chaotic and beautiful all at once. And something that we've been playing with uh, my studio team and I in New York City is this format that we're calling VR theater, where we're actually performing to two audiences simultaneously. Usually that's a live audience in a theater with everyone gathered together close to each other in this dark and intimate magical space. And now that live audience is you guys watching online from your homes. You're now the live audience. And then simultaneously, we have the virtual world running in parallel, and that will gather a, a potential virtual audience. Today, we're keeping that small as we're running these experiments. So that's what we're doing, and we are going to show you a trailer to look back at our very first experiment in this format, 
which we performed at the Venice International Film Festival just about eight months ago in this September of 2019. Um, it was a production we built amazingly quickly in, in roughly about six weeks um, with playwright Mac Rogers. And that was from casting to 3D modeling to creating the virtual world, everything. So we're gonna take you inside that world and play the trailer from Love Seat. met anyone like you, perfect partner. <laughs> You're like an electric blanket plugged into the sun. I will transform into a colossus of organization to protect you, my shield of preparedness. Let's fly. Don't fly the perfect partner over a portal to another dimension. Are you nuts? Walking where no bee ever has. Huh. But he landed anyway. The fresh chance to pair an ordinary someone with the perfect partner. I see a, a face that's still ready to just jump into the unknown and witness nature's like chaotic wonders with exhilaration instead of fear. Keeping it a thing in maintenance. That is a daily, hourly battle against every force that exists. If you saw your perfect partner sitting in that chair, what would you see? So joining us here now, live from across the country, we have Jonathan David Martin, as you may see him in headset, he can hear us and he can see those of you in the virtual world. And he is on the stage of Love Seat now. And Jonathan originated the role of Bruce in the production of Love Seat. So Jonathan David Martin in California and Jen Harris, who is here with us in New York City. Jen originated the role of Abby. And we're just gonna run uh, a scene that happens in the production um, it is technically scene five. And what's happening here is these two characters of Abby and Bruce have been competing for the love of the perfect partner. And we kind of did this production in a very light and sort of presentational style, but there are these undercurrents running through the production, these themes about loneliness and connection. And these two characters are, are not in love and they have different opinions about what love means to them. And they find themselves magically on this reality competition show in this virtual world. And they're competing for the love of the perfect partner, which happens to be represented to the audience as an empty chair. And what happens here is these two characters are going to, this is kind of their second round of competition right now. They're gonna vie for this. And they're both assigned to compete for different audiences. And so, Bruce is assigned to the virtual audience and Abby is assigned to the live audience, which in this case will, is you guys online. So I'm gonna give them their first, the line that the host gives them to set off this competition and they're both gonna compete for your attention. Okay, Abby and Bruce, let the interviews begin. There's a reason I chose these over lovers. I dated a lot of mediocre people in my life. Weak people, unimaginative people, or the total opposite, like controlling people who wanted my life to match theirs. I kept on believing and I kept on being let down until I made a momentous decision for myself. I'm leaving the game forever. I'd rather be lonely than disappointed. And, and, and I've stuck to that decision for years. And for me to go back on that now, I mean, it would have to be someone amazing. Well, the perfect partner is that amazing. And you better believe I'm not gonna let Bruce stand in my way. I'm not here to make friends. There's nothing I won't do to win this game.
Well, of course, it would be Abby who'd be trying to ruin things for me. I mean, it's been that way since the moment she moved in two years ago. I mean, always trying to act like I'm the one with the problem. Oh, what's wrong, Bruce? Don't you like honey? Well, you know, actually, no, I don't. It's thick, it's sticky, it gets into every nook and cranny. I mean, it is impossible to clean. Every time I try to establish some exquisite order in this building, she comes along and she pours that stuff all over it. But, I, mean, I never thought that she would try to drip her beeswax over my one chance of happiness. And, and hey, not just mine, I mean, the perfect partners too, because I know that they would be happier with me. I'm not here to make friends, and she is not the only one with a sting in her tail. Awesome, awesome. Thank you guys. So Jonathan, I'm here in VR with you right now. Hey, and I see that you're kind of hovering in this quadrant, which is typical of your blocking from Venice. Why don't you feel free to use more of the stage, you know, and even if you want to teleport into the audience. I know we're uh, just like the theaters in New York, you know, we're without a lot of audience right now. Um, but feel free to use, use the whole stage. Great, you want me to just pick it up from the top of that? Uh, yeah, Jen, could you start and give uh, and give Jonathan the the line just before? Um, I know that we've you know we've kind of rearranged this from how we originally did it. Could you just give him uh, a little bit of your maybe if you come from while well, the perfect partner is that amazing? Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. You ready, Jonathan? All set. Okay. <laughs> Well, the perfect partner is that amazing. And you better believe I'm not gonna let Bruce stand in my way. I'm not here to make friends. And there's nothing I want you to win this game. Well, of course, it would be Abby who'd be trying to ruin this for me. Always trying to act like I'm the one with the problem. Oh, what's wrong with bees, Bruce? Don't you like honey? Well, you know, actually, I don't. It is the it's sticky. It gets into every nook and cranny. It's impossible to clean. Every time I try to establish some exquisite order in this building, she comes along and she pours that stuff all over it. But I, I never thought that she would try to ruin my one chance of happiness dripping her beeswax all over it. And hey, not just mine, I mean, the perfect partners too. Because I know that they would be happier with me. I'm not here to make friends. And she is not the only one with a sting in her tail. <laughs> nice, guys. Um, awesome. So now, why don't we skip forward to a later scene that happens in the production? And this is going to be scene eight. And so what's happening in this scene is it's it's quite a a moment and tonal change for the production. It's really this moment of a kind of reckoning and reasoning, this kind of break in reality. Um, the scene that we just showed you was actually a moment where Abby took her headset off and, and addressed the live audience. And this is another moment where that happens for her as her perception of what's in the chair she's realizing is actually different from that of what Bruce has been seeing in the chair. And so I'm going to let them uh, shift into this moment and, you know, and uh, get a little real with you guys as we take it here. So Jen, whenever, whenever Abby is ready, whenever you're ready. <clears throat> well, I don't see a beard. What I see is a clean, hairless face an earnest face, a young face, a face that's still even a face that hasn't learned the habit of sneering, a face that doesn't know what kind of adult it wants to be, and is open to deciding that in tandem with someone else, a face that's ready to just plunge into the unknown, where that looks at nature's chaotic wonders with exhilaration instead of fear. A face that turns every corner expecting to see something amazing instead of a fist in the teeth. 
a face that thinks that shadows hide treasures instead of claws. A face worth breaking a promise you made yourself for. A face worth giving up on giving up for. It's weird. What is? But I, I, I can see it while you say it. I mean, you know, why you say those words, I can see it, but. but then it goes back to what you see? Yeah. Which is what? Well, I, I mean, there's the beard, of course, but but it's it's not about the beard. It's it's about all of the beard type things that I see there. What's a beard type thing? Oh well, it's it's a it's a thing that it's a thing that you can make perfect, but it'll never stay that way. Meaning that it will always need maintenance, and someone that wants to do that maintenance.
ya. So, so this, this is, is an experiment, experiment like we said at the beginning, we have a lot of feeds coming into the system from all over the world. Our moderator is going to be joining us from Milan and Italy later. And uh, some of you might be trying to watch in VR right now. Our actor Jonathan is still in there right now, still embodying his avatar and character of Bruce. So we're going to take it from the top of scene eight. And again, this is this place in the show where our two characters are having this realization that they've been seeing someone different in this chair, which of course to the audience looks like an empty chair. And I think we're all feeling these themes of emptiness and loneliness these days. So thank you for those of you who hung in there with us. And again, sorry for this technical glitch while we push all of this technology together. So Jen and Jonathan, as Abby, Abby and Bruce. Bruce. Why, Why don't you take, take it from the top, top of scene eight? eight. Okay. <clears throat> well, I don't, I don't see, see a beard. beard. What, what I, I see, see is, is a clean, hairless face. face. An, An earnest face. face. A young face. face. You know, a face, face that's still, still ready to believe, believe anything. anything. A face, a face that, that hasn't has learned the habit of sneering. A face that still doesn't know what kind of adult it wants to be and is open to deciding that in tandem with someone else. A face that's ready to plunge into the unknown, that looks at nature's chaotic wonders with exhilaration instead of fear. A face that turns every corner expecting to see something amazing instead of a fist in the teeth. A face that thinks that shadows hide treasures instead of walls. A face worth breaking a promise you made yourself for. A face worth giving up on giving up for. It's weird. What is? I can see it while you see it. 
But while you say those words, I can see it, but then it goes back to... Wait, when you see it? Yeah. Which is what? Well, it's like, well, there's the beard. But it, it's not about the beard. It's, it's about all of the beard type things that I see there. What's a beard type thing? Well, it's a thing that you can work on and make perfect, but it'll never stay that way. Meaning that it will always need maintenance. And someone that wants to do that maintenance, because I mean, if you think about it, maintenance is the hardest thing to do on this earth. Soaring above enchanting cloud loops, that only takes a moment or two, but keeping those hedgerows trimmed when all they want to do is grow, but that is a whole life's work. Maintenance is a daily, hourly battle against every force that exists. Against this is where grease, dirt, aging, danger against time. Keeping a thing in a state of organization and cleanliness, it's creative, it's quixotic. It's, it's standing up in the face of decay and saying, everything that you accomplished today, I'm going to roll that right back. You're going to have tomorrow and try again. I mean, maintenance is a battle that you always lose. It's a battle worth fighting. And you can create so much truth while you're fighting. And that's what I see. The chance to take the maintenance that I've mastered in the rest of my life and bring it into love. And as you're saying it, I can see it. But as soon as I stop, it goes back in their mind again. Beautiful, guys. Thank you. Thank you for doing that again. Thank you for staying in character and, and all your patience. And the same to you, digital audience. So, Jonathan, I'm going to let you change domains now and uh, portal over, teleport over to the Pandora domain. Head on over to Mount Olympus. And I'm going to see you over there. Um, right, you know what, actually, maybe I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and teleport through that too. And we're going to do this audience experiment now, and we're going to bring up something called Slido. Um, and for those of you that are watching online, we are going to need your Facebook comments. So please, Facebook viewers, we, we need you to, uh, to watch and send comments to these questions that we're going to be asking you about. Oh, great. I think I need to see the portal in time. Excellent. So while Jonathan and I head over to the Olympus virtually, Jonathan, I'll see you over there. Um, we're going to try out this exciting audience experiment. So I've got this question up on the on this website that we're playing with called Slido, and we're going to build a word collage here. Um, eventually, um, eventually, that's, that's going to take over on the, the, the left side of the screen. screen. You'll, You'll see that, that Mount Olympus will change into this Slido image. image. And, and we've got, got these questions for you guys. guys. So, so for those of you on Facebook, Facebook, can you type, type in a response, response to the location of your last dream? dream? And, and Jen, how, how about you? you? Do you remember? Do you dream? Do you remember any of your dreams? Um, I... I actually don't dream very vividly, but I did have a dream the other night um, that I was on a street somewhere. Open a street. On the street. Okay, so we're going to put street in. And for those of you on Facebook, yeah, we got one. We're taking a look at your uh, oh, a dark shifting hypercube. Wow, we've got a dark shifting hypercube. Uh, this, uh, this is from our from video artist, artist Michael. Michael. That, that makes, makes a lot, lot of sense. sense. I can I can uh, only imagine that. Kira, uh, uh, so Toby, Toby Lawrence says beach. beach. Beach, beautiful. beautiful. Julia, Julia Baker says outdoors. outdoors. She was outdoors when she dreamed. Really nice. Uh, Ulrich, Ulrich says his grandmother's, grandmother's kitchen. kitchen. 
Oh, that must be a lovely place. <laughs> Mac <laughs> Rogers, our writer, set of love seats as a bus. Awesome. We've got Angelique. Uh, these are some other virtual reality creators that are that are jumping in here through our digital stream. Angelique has near a tree, and Kim has got a lawn chair. <laughs> Michael on the beach. <laughs> Beautiful guys. Michael spends a lot of time in VR. Yes, clearly. Maybe he lives there. <laughs> yeah, he probably does. Alyssa says countryside. Oh, nice. That's pretty. These are some amazing locations. And some of them even have some overlapping themes I can see. So I'm gonna change it to a new question, guys. Here we go. We're gonna we're gonna change it to something that deals with colors. So culture hub team, if we update the slido, it should change over to these colors right now. Awesome, beautiful, blue, yellow. Yeah. I see a pink. And the question is, what colors do you see in, what colors did you see in your last stream? Yeah. Mine is blue. Black and white. Technicolor. Ooh, I like I that one. Technicolor. We could do a little musical there, right? Amazing Technicolor dream coat. Green, not my favorite musical. <laughs> do you have a favorite musical, Jen? Um, <laughs> I actually think uh, Hairspray is a perfect musical. Mm. I was going to ask Silence. Well, I didn't want to, Silence musical is the best musical ever written, but I didn't want to self-promote too deeply. <laughs> For those of you in the New York theater scene, you may have seen Jen uh, perform the Jodie Foster character in Silence. <laughs> Angelique says turquoise. Turquoise, that's a beautiful color. <laughs> <laughs> now we're on musicals. Michael Sherman, <laughs> musical. Nope, movie doesn't count. Gray, <laughs> gray. Okay, amazing. Really, really great colors. Thank you, digital audience. I love this. Thank you for being a part of this experiment. I'm going to take it to one final question, which is going to take us really into the land of VR, where we're going to get back to Jonathan soon. And so this last question is, what superpower would you like to have? Hmm. <laughs> Flying. Yeah, that's a really good one. I like that one, Songman. <laughs> Could a superpower be like curing a virus, like a virus killer? I think that's what we're doing right now. Jen, that's brilliant. Why not? Seems a little universal. <laughs> All right. <laughs> to be invisible, flying. Angelique says to be invisible. Ulrich says flying. Kim says flying, Alyssa says flying. I see from Michael, the ability to stop time. Yeah. I also liked Jen's uh, ability to cure a virus. Yeah, how can we put that into like keywords? Virus killer? No. <laughs> virus extinguisher. That's a good one. Your virus, I see if that I see. Invisibility. Toby says invisibility. Absolutely. These are really, really marvelous. So we're going to experiment with all of these ideas that you've given us here and generated collectively, and we're gonna think about ways that we might be able to integrate them into our virtual production going forward. So thank you so much, live audience, for doing this experiment with 
Jen and I helping us build out this word cloud of potential. And we're gonna come back to VR. Jen's gonna disappear off stage as she does. And we're gonna find Jonathan in the virtual world. There he is, he's back. And he's going to uh, play with this new monologue that Alyssa Landry, a writer from Pandora X has crafted for him. It's all in verse. Um, he just got the text a handful of days ago, so he's probably going to call for line, um, and I'm going to be juggling VR with him and also seeing uh, him on lines in case, in case he needs them. So um, this is really new, really experimental. Welcome to our new domain that we just got uploaded on VR chat. You know, shout out to the platform. We're excited to be playing with this new platform in virtual reality. This social VR platform where we can all gather together in this in this exciting temple and space and uh, magical space. So Jonathan, as your Zeus character, I'm gonna let you take it from the top of this temple and find your way down to the dais and just take it whenever you're ready. Yeah. Take your time. Take your time. All out for line. Sorry, yes, Jonathan. There's a jump in headset. We already good. Jump in. Jump in. Okay. I'll rehearse this. Okay, Jonathan. Shoot. Go so whenever you're ready. Great. Satyrs and nymphs of the forest and streams, muses of Greece who give glory through song. Goddesses, gods, awake from your sleep. Come hither, come nigh, and join the throng. I, the great Zeus, do so command. Mine is the power to make a man strong. I humble the proud and raise up the obscure. Whomsoever shall call me wrong will suffer my vengeance swift and sure. I, the great Zeus, do so command. Hephaestus. 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 Ah, attend to me now. Hephaestus, the sculptor. Come, Aphrodite of beauty untold. Athena, bring now your wisdom and valor. And Hermes, bring your voice strong and bold. Are you here? I feel you. Mm. Lend me your ears and eyes, my friends and allies. For the time has come to strike again, to shake with fear the hearts of all men. Prometheus, did you think my vengeance forgotten, that your misbegotten act would be lost in the mists of Mount Olympus? Do you not recall the destruction and danger? The thunder, the bolts of anger, which from my hand rain down upon the heads of man. A plague upon you for bringing fire. A plague on all men who embrace their desire. And by that beloved object shall know a fate most abject, living in misery, bereft, without a shred of hope left. Did you think I'd forget my sacred vow? That the passage of time would efface it somehow? Nothing is forgotten. Really nice, Jonathan. Um, thank you, virtual camera team, for all you guys are doing, changing up cameras and following Jonathan around in this space. So Jonathan, 
I've got an idea for you. Let's play with something where you change avatars. Can you actually stay down here on this dais, mm -hmm. right where you are? And I've got this idea where you did with the character of Bruce and Love Seed and you grew really tall. Um, you've got some avatars that are a little bit bigger. Could you pick a bigger avatar and just start from your line Prometheus and just take it from Prometheus to the end and try it in a bigger avatar? Great. I want to see what this does to your sense of height, sense of scale, see if this gives you a different perspective for when you get to these lines. Okay. And if you need a line, feel free to call line. I'm here on book. Prometheus, did you think my vengeance forgotten? That your misbegotten act would be lost in the mists of Mount Olympus. Do you not recall the destruction and danger, the thunder, the bolts of anger which from my hand rained down upon the heads of man? A plague upon you for stealing pride, a plague on all men who embrace their desire. And by that beloved object shall know a thing most abject, living in fear bereft without a shred of hope left. Do you think I would forget my sacred vow? That the passage of time would have faced it somehow? <laughs> Nothing is forgotten. Really interesting. Thank you so much for trying that. I like it. I think there's something interesting happening there with with the size of this character and what that's doing to, to your body posture and your voice. Um, great, so we are going to uh, let Jonathan come out of VR and we're all going to head into a Q&A now. Um, and I'll just, I'll remind everybody that the avatars that we're using right now in the Zeus scenes in this Pandora, these are temporary avatars. They're avatars that are created by other creators that we found online in VR chat. Um, they belong to other stories and worlds, uh, and we have not designed ours, customized ours yet. But if you are a VR 3D modeler and you want to work with us, let us know because we are looking for the right creators to partner with um, to create uh, the you know customized world that we'll be building for this for this Pandora Mount Olympus. So we're going to come into a, a Q and A and bring the Love Seat creative team back. Um, Jen is going to come back to the stage. Mac Rogers, our writer, is going to join us, and I'm going to pass the torch over entirely. And I'm going to I'm going to not talk very much. I can just be a really quiet human, um, and and pass the torch over to Chiara Spagnoli Gabardi, who is joining us all the way from Milan in Italy. And uh, keep in mind that now that we're connecting more devices to this, everything may disappear again and, and we may have to you know re-import things and you know we're all, we're really pushing all the technology in this system here so so we're gonna bring all we're gonna bring like five video feeds to the screen we're gonna try and see if we can pull this off for this q a and those of you on facebook in the comments feel free to drop in questions for the love seat team for our actors what it's like for them to be doing what they're doing um, for our writer, Mac and Kiara, over to you. I think we're just, we're just, uh, maybe she's just going to come to the screen, to the stage in just Thank a moment you. here. It's easy to get lost backstage here. It is. There we are. Everyone's on stage. We all made it to the virtual stage. Exciting. <laughs> Exciting indeed. And thank you so much for this onerous experience through Love Seat and then Slido and Pandora. So I would like to begin with you, Kira, since uh, uh, you're the director. And I, I recall um, admiring Love Seat in Venice at the film festival, and I truly agreed with uh, Michel Rayac who sought a touch of Lumiere Brothers, uh, a budding new media at its very beginning. And I wanted to know you as a pioneering um, 
the art artist who uh, manages to blend in uh, such an archaic medium as that of theatre. Uh, if uh, what was your reaction in in Venice and seeing how the live audience um, was engaged in this uh, completely new experience? Well, it's it's we're definitely blending forms here, and I feel like I'm very much an explorer and an experimenter. So the title of this whole series with Culture Hub and La Mama is very fitting. Um, I do feel like we are, you know, we are experimenting in this medium and these multiple medias that we're combining. And even here right now with everyone gathered online, this is yet another format for us. We intended to do this live through it to a regular theater audience um, and still maintaining our parallel world also to a live audience, but in VR. So those are still two live components, which we have playing here, um, but this was not the intended format. So this is yet a new a new venture for us. And um, I mean, the audience in Venice was, was wonderful. They were very pleasant. I didn't know how they might react to the actors being on stage in headsets for the majority of the production, you know, about 75% of the time they're in headsets only in some key moments do they come out um, and talk to the audience face to face. And at the same time, they're getting all of these projection screens of what's happening from the virtual world. I wasn't sure if that would read or mean anything to the audience, but we had some really interesting conversations with audience after about how they did understand that there was this virtual world and how they did pick up on these really touching themes about loneliness in this production, which just feels incredibly timely for us to be dealing with right now in these times. Absolutely. I, th I find it, it's a very uh, nourishing art for the soul of VR right now, now that we're all locked indoors. Um, I wanted to share the, the uh, similar insight with the actors, Jen and Jonathan, starting with Jen, um, because I, want, I know you, Jen, have a, a very solid background in theatre, and I wanted to know what it feels like to perform in VR, breaking that fourth wall. In, in Love Seat, I saw you switching from the theatre to this digital realm, and uh, both uh, you and Jonathan were acting with this heavy gear, so what is it like to, to perform in VR? Um, thank you. I, I actually, uh, breaking the fourth wall by lifting the headset up and showing the audience was sort of the most familiar, of course, because that's the most close to me being able to see and feel the audience. Um, it did take a lot of getting used to, uh, the VR just because you, you knew an audience was out there, you just couldn't see them. And even though on a stage, sometimes with lights, you can't see the audience anyway. But there was something about being in a space that you knew wasn't the literal space and still performing, knowing that people are watching you and hoping that makes it make sense. But after a while, I got used to it. And the, the stage that uh, they built, that we, we built virtually, I got used to it. And that just felt like the stage. And when I saw Jonathan's avatar, that just felt like Jonathan. And I knew that he was near me, around me, but anytime, I just got used to it. And that with the blocking that we did, the virtual blocking, um, once we, that was sort of the most, the trickiest thing, but once we got that down, it actually felt very comfortable to me. And um, it was different, but more like anything else with practice and like good blocking, it, it feels like acting. Well, I, I can imagine it, it must have been quite an experience. And obviously, Jonathan, if you want to add some of that, and with you, I would also like to expand on the themes of Love Seat, which are very pertinent to the way the contemporary world interacts through all these uh, apps and dating sites. And I know you, your past works uh, revolved around socially relevant topics. So perhaps uh, what, uh, what themes in Love Seat were very dear to you. Yeah, I think thematically, one of the things uh, I really resonated with was this theme of identity. And of course, anytime that we're talking about um, 
our virtual selves and our corporeal selves, there's uh, uh, a real conscious design thing that we're doing with our virtual selves. How do we want to appear to people? How do we want to present ourselves in a virtual space? Because we can curate our our personas our, and identities in a really particular way. And um, and so I found that really fascinating to, um, to kind of be in a show that was really pushing the exploration of that topic in a really, uh, what felt like a really new and uh, an interesting way. Um, and um, I, I think that there's also this um, question about what is connection and what is love. So, you know, when, when this is both sort of, uh, it's a bit of a meta theme in the show, right? We're, we're trying to connect as performers to two different audiences and then to try to connect to each other uh, on two different levels as actors, both with our avatars and, and in the space together. Um, and the characters are really trying to do that as well. And they're trying to figure out what the, what they want. Like they, they really like having their space and yet they sort of realize that they actually not only want companionship, but they would rather have real companionship than, than just the, their own idea in their own hermetically sealed world. Um, and so I think that that's, that's a very universal topic, but it's certainly one that I think we're all grappling with in new ways because of um, both because of the pandemic and also because of technology. Definitely. I found it very fascinating the way our playwright, Mac, uh, to which I'm going to be asking the next question, was uh, very much delving into this idea of the, what meaning we give to words when uh, in scene eight you were discussing a beard type thing. It very much evoked Shakespeare. Uh, a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. And uh, of course, I wanted to know from Mac, um, what defines the perfect partner and how was the writing process to uh, create a parallelism between this uh, existential idea of love and the more uh, uh, pragmatic and uh, digital dating that occurs nowadays. <laughs> well, it's funny. I, I, I have a big, uh, I had a big sort of chasm to cross in order to like uh, 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 engage with this topic at all on a couple levels. I mean, this, is, this is one of many ways in which I feel like the old timer getting to play with the kids on this project uh, because everything, I, I, I'm the guy who's been writing like plays my whole life. I don't know any of this technology. I'd never worked with VR before. And so like when Kira approached me about it, I was like, you're going to have to walk me. I don't even know what the script should look like in this genre. Uh, and she said, no, no, I approach you because you're a playwright. Let's, you know, let's write a play, but a play that can kind of explode outward into the kinds of realities that you wouldn't, you know, just put into like the more, uh, uh, you know, the, the, in, that you wouldn't put in a, in a black box theater space like I've always been writing for. Now you mentioned, uh, uh, you mentioned uh, Shakespeare and and uh, the Rose by your name. There was a lot of that um, when we got to the process of defining how the love story was going to work uh, uh, in this, like how it could be something that we could be rhapsodic and inspirational, but at the same time, as you say, have that kind of pragmatic touch that could make audiences believe that they'd seen a genuine love story happen right in front of their eyes. Uh, th a big part of it was actually starting with some of those Shakespearean traditions in, in, the, in the form of the host, where it's like, could you actually have, instead of the puck from Midsummer Night's Dream, who makes people fall in love for no reason, just enchants them, makes them fall in love with each other, uh, and because purely because of a compulsory magic enchantment. What if our host, what if Bartholomew Bess, our host in Love Seat, brought people together in a much more consensual and clear-eyed way? What if we could take that, the sort of rhapsodic Shakespearean energy of Midsummer Night's Dream, but turn it into something that, that, that the two people falling in love felt like they were full partners with agency in it, and, and just something that audiences could believe. So the beard moment that you're talking about right there at the middle, that was the crucial turning point of the script. I'm not exactly sure how many drafts we had to go through to find the beard section, but we definitely, I mean, we don't smoke cigars, but if we did, we would have lit up cigars when we came up with the beard idea because we've been looking for that turning point. What's the moment in which our two partners, uh, in which Abby and Bruce 
figure out that they're seeing different things. Because the moment that they realize they're seeing different things, that's the moment when they can actually build a bridge to each other. That's the moment when they are clear eyed, they see the differences and seeing those differences, they can imagine a way to bridge those differences. The beard was the moment where Bruce references the beard. Abby says, whoa, 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 wait a second. I don't see a beard. Then they each describe what they are, what they are individually seeing, hear those differences and, and it, it only at that moment can begin to imagine a world in which those differences are reconcilable. Right. It's, uh, it's basically projecting how each person uh, is projecting the, his or her idea. I would like to wrap up this section with Kira um, to delve into more the, this, the VR dating situation. Of course, you portray it in a fictional world. Um, I, I would like to know from you if you think this could become a thing since VR is developing so quickly in all sorts of ways. Sure. I, mean, I think this would be a very fun, a uh, very fun competition show for, for people dating and looking for something new. Why not? I mean, Mac could write an app. Our actors could be involved to add questions, com competitions and things that people could go through in VR together to get to know one another. Sure. I think it's very imaginative. It's probably better than other things that are out there right now. I think we've got, I'm noticing- Jen and Jonathan have created the, the role model. Sorry, Jerry, you got cut off. Um, one last question. Uh, I'm informed. One more question from the audience. I'm informed. They wanted to know the different experience of acting within the VR world. Uh, sure. So I'll, I'll jump in, jump in first. I think um, act, acting in VR is a, for me, it reminds me a lot of, uh, of, of being a puppeteer. And um, because the avatar essentially is a puppet, it's, it's sort of like a, a full mask that you're wearing and uh, you can't uh, convey um, physically expression and meaning and thought and emotion the same way you do with your own body. So um, it, it actually reminds me a lot of that. Um, there's something also that's interesting when you're both performing uh, in a in a live space in front of a live audience and also in front of a virtual audience in that you're trying to juggle um, two spaces at the same time and two senses of awareness between those two spaces. Um, and actually, you know, today I was thinking about again how um, everything that's being captured today with what I'm doing in VR is actually being captured by a, a virtual camera. And so there's this other layer of I'm doing virtual theater for a camera. And uh, so that's, those are all very unique things uh, in terms of where my head is at as an actor, as opposed to just being on stage. Wow, fascinating. Jen, do you have some yeah. insight for us in these regards? Yeah, yeah. Again, the question was from uh, Toby, what are some differences that actors experience that the audience would not think of when acting on stage versus acting in headset? And just to piggyback on what Jonathan was saying, when we were in headset, we also had a camera crew shooting us in VR. So when we were, so if you were in headset and you were watching it, if we had to know where the we had to sort of learn where the camera was. So not only were you acting for screen, you were also acting for camera. So you kind of had to get an idea. Like when you flew up to the cloud, you had to like look. There was a cloud I flew up to, and then when I flew up to the cloud, I knew I had to look down this way because that's where the camera angle is coming, so that people in VR didn't see the back of my avatar. So there was some blocking for camera that we were doing that the audience didn't. No, you know, hopefully they know and they just saw it perfectly on, on the screen if they were live in Venice or in, in VR if they were in VR. Wow, 
Well, excellent. I look forward to see more of your performances in VR with uh, Kira directing you and of course with her amazing tech team coordinating every everything. And uh, we shall move on to them for more questions. Yeah. Yeah, we're back to you. Yes, we're back. All right, we're joined by the fantastic and amazing tech team. And I'm going to be starting with a, a question from Mark. I actually had my own, but uh, we also have a brilliant question from uh, Michael Woods joining us in the audience. He wanted to know, um, I I'll read it out to you. So it's his words exactly. I don't know if this is possible, but assuming much faster processing, is the performance able to be recorded not just as a video, but as a Unity asset? Yeah, so that's actually a pretty involved question. There was a company that was looking into doing this. I think they're defunct right now. Um, What's involved? So we can't do it quite yet with the VR chat platform. Although VR chat does run in Unity, theoretically we could uh, do that in the future with some development. But it is theoretically possible to record a performance in such a way that it would be almost as Zoom assets that then people could go in and see again. So like pre-recorded immersive theater that you could then move through and walk around in. Basically, um, just for everyone, the way that this sort of works is. We're using avatars that are rigged with skeletons. And what each one of the pieces of the skeleton, there's about 20 pieces in this skeleton. It's obviously a real human one, there's over 200. But each one of the pieces of the skeleton has what's called a transform that tells you how it moves in space. Um, so if you recorded how each one of those joints moved and transformed and scaled through the world, uh, you could then um, record that and play it back to somebody to see the performance later. Uh, the technology for that would need to be coded. It doesn't quite exist yet, but it is clear. Yeah, that's great. Hope that answers the question. I see. Well, well, thanks for clarifying this. Um, maybe um, more um, philosophically tech question for our Lara. Um, since I was fascinated by your experience also in mental uh, wellness that blended with virtual reality. And if you could tell us a bit more about the interconnectedness issues related in, uh, in Love Seat, and of course, how this can be beneficial uh, for, for a virtual audience, considering right now we're all living in, the, in isolation and alienation. So 
how it can bring us together and also give examples of this through the work you did on Love Seed. Definitely, uh, that's a very thoughtful question. I think um, in today's state, people often think that technology draws us apart, but I don't think that's the case. I think technology is a way to bring us together. And there's different ways of using technology as a medium, whether it's through narrative and storytelling, or through different applications with mixed reality, that you can draw people together by making it seem like they're in the same room together, or they're participating in the same activity together, um, or creating a sense of community. I think that's so necessary right now, and especially because we've been forced into this situation due to COVID-19. Um, so there's different ways and, and different studios I've been fortunate, uh, fortunate enough to work with besides Kira's that have been trying to solve this problem of how do we, how do we connect people. Um, so it's interesting to see the ways that people have applied mixed reality technology to make this possible. Um, one piece I'm working on, uh, Lou Ward, he's brilliant out of Seattle, he, he's trying to teach people what Alzheimer's is really like uh, by putting it in the first person perspective. So he created a narrative around that experience. What Kira is doing with the stage is incredible. She's connecting the audience with the actors and making them in the same environment together, um, kind of with no, no proscenium. Um, so the way that technology has evolved the arts is tremendous and the way that it's going to, it's going to connect uh, individuals in the future. I just can't wait to see what's going to happen. Well, definitely. I agree with you on this sense of community that VR creates. I experienced it at the Venice Film Festival. And I wanted to ask a question to Christopher Topino, because obviously being part of the Love Seat team, it, he was there, set up this entire um, dreamlike state at the Lazzaro Vecchio Island, which actually used to be a uh, uh, a hospital that cured people during the plague epidemic, so it's, we can relate to it right now. And uh, since you are so accustomed to, to VR stages, what was it, both from a technical and perhaps a more personal and spiritual point of view, to, uh, to create a VR theatre in that setting? Um, so, when we arrived I, uh, I, th I think Mark was the first one to point out that uh, this many hundred year old space uh, is a, a, an extremely dusty <laughs> location. And we're, we're trying to very quickly set up 14 uh, very powerful gaming computers. And uh, we were immediately, <laughs> concerned that uh, that all this dust in the air was going to uh, affect the computers. Um, the uh, yeah, I think um, I think the uh, the challenges of being on an island in a uh, in an ancient uh, or relatively ancient uh, facility uh, or kind of just added to the stakes the whole time the uh, just the, you know even the the first few days that we were there um, there was no uh, there was no consistent uh, you know food or water on the on the island so we'd have to wait for a, a boat to get back to the to the other side to be able to actually um, get any food or, or coffee um, which is pretty essential for me at the moment. <laughs> um, uh, then as far as actually rigging, you know, uh, it was really important that, uh, that nothing, nothing could actually touch the structure because it was so old and so uh, uh, protective. And so, um, so we had to, uh, we were not allowed to actually rig any of our any of our sensors or any of our wiring to to the actual beams in the space and then uh, lastly uh, the I think the 
part of the the power of the uh, the experience being there, and one of the things that made it, um, it so surreal was that I mean, this was this was a space where where oh, hundreds, thousands of people uh, perished uh, during the plague, and uh, you know, in the room just next door to where we were setting up the you know there were etchings on the wall of patients who um, uh, who had been quarantined there uh, you know hundreds of years ago so um, yeah the, the eerie and magical <laughs> uh, are sort of the, the words that come to mind there um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if that fully answers the question but that's where we're, that's where we're at Oh, it definitely does answer the question. Um, we have one more question for uh, Chris Dawes uh, from the audience and um, or from any other of you who want to jump into the conversation. Um, there's uh, one of our members from the audience who would like to know how many actors can be on stage at one time. And this is Kim. Kasani, who's asking. Yeah, uh, I, I can take that one. So um, the domains have their own limits. Um, you can't generally have more than 30 to 40 people without seeing a performance, without seeing a performance drop. Um, so because it, it, what it's essentially doing is you're sharing a connection with multiple people, 30 people at the same time. So these domains usually can handle 30 to 40 people. Uh, what we can do is is um, actually similar to what Michael Woods was asking about before. You can create several instances where some people are in different rooms, but can only but the actors themselves are sort of interdimensional and can be seen in multiple dimensions, like throughout these various instances. But the in the, they would only see the people that are in the first instance, but their performances would then be carried to these other instances where other audiences would be. But for them, they wouldn't be able to interact. With them. Okay. Yeah. Um, just one more curiosity from from our audience members. Um, do the technicians come from? Do do all of you guys come from creative backgrounds or more engineer and software ones? Uh. I can start. I come from a more creative background. Um, I started more in traditional film. Um, the next logical leap was 360 video, which was popular for a while. Um, but I've gotten increasingly into these room scale VR experiences, um, 60 degree freedom. Um, and while I do, have, I do have that creative background, I've um, been definitely supplementing it with the knowledge of Unity, which is a game engine that a lot of these experiences are built in. Um, even Unity is a basis for creating these worlds and everything that you see in VR chat um, and the avatars are also built in. Unity. So if you're interested in this space, you can definitely start off creative, but you will, you know, uh, it helps to develop your technological background. One of the things that I think is amazing about mixed reality, and I'm sure everyone in the WI team will agree, is that you need to take all your different knowledge sets and and things that you never thought would be like become tangible or that you would use for example i was an english major and i minored in brain and cognitive science and i find that mixed reality is the beautiful fusion of the two because you're dealing with perception and, and how you see the world and, and what's real and, and what does connection and, and interaction mean and and technology is a means to to make that fit together better. Um, so I think in all different facets, mixed reality and, and technology and immersive technology, you're not just dealing with, with that necessary software background, but um, everything that you can bring to the table to make it make it better for, for people and, and their experience is important. Uh, 
Um, I personally but it definitely come from the is business. a very interdisciplinary um, topic. And, and yes, please, please continue. Yeah, my apologies. Um, I also come from a business background and a creative background. So I'm a corporate product manager and a documentary filmmaker. And in my day job, I actually briefly worked in Unity to create a, a technical pavilion for a, a show that we were doing. And that's how I got interested in virtual reality. And Kira and I have actually collaborated on um, documentary film projects before. So it was really exciting to be able to collaborate with her in the VR world as well. Um, on my end, Excellent. I am similar to Mark. Christopher Topino, a very, very quick background on you so we can move on to the next segment. Yeah, I was uh, just saying the. Uh, similar to Mark, I started in, I started in film. Um, I have been in, uh, in consumer technology for, uh, for quite a while. And, uh, um, VR has sort of merged those two, uh, uh, those two tracks in my life. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it. Well, thank you guys for sharing your background. It feels like many people watching us today might decide to change jobs since the virtual reality is such a, a fascinating and educational field. Um, next up, we will be bringing the creative Pandora X. So stay with us for the Q&A. we are back yes we are and we are joined by Alyssa Landry who is a writer of Pandora X and she also collaborated on um, Love Seat and here I see you and uh, Jonathan I assume there he is uh, so I would like to start with Alyssa since we still haven't had the chance to chat um, well, first of all, what uh, inspired you in, into creating, uh, into bringing the Greek myth of Pandora to VR and uh, how timely you feel it is to show it now that in a way it is almost as if we were living those evils of the world being unleashed um, as a jar was opened and hope remaining there at the end of that jar, waiting for us to, to move on. <laughs> yes, well, I have to say that that is a, a very timely coincidence. Um, at the beginning, we were really searching for our newest subject. Uh, and I believe it was Mark and Lara who first came up with the idea of doing something from Greek mythology. Um, I know that for both Kira and myself, that's uh, uh, Greek mythology has been something that's fascinated us since we were very small. I remember when I was, uh, oh, probably about 12, rewriting all the Greek myths and making a book for my younger sisters and reading it to them. Uh, so we went through our minds through, through uh, quite a few different female heroines 
gods in, in Greek mythology until we hit on Pandora. And the reason we hit on Pandora is because we discovered in doing our research that the original Pandora myth that predated um, the version that we all now know, uh, in that oral myth, before it was written down, Pandora was actually an earth goddess and she uh, was the person who um, led souls into the heavens, led them up to Mount Olympus after they had passed. And there was a festival where she opened up these wonderful, enormous jars and released not only the evils, but all of the good into the world. So she was really the nature goddess who was in charge of keeping balance in the world. And little by little, her myth was rewritten actually by men. And the version that we all know, know today was written by Hesiod. And he apparently was a crusty old bachelor who did not like women. And he transformed that myth into Pandora, who it was by woman that all of the evils were going to come into the world. Um, and then still later, a different Christian priest actually in a sermon transformed that enormous jar into a very small box and thereby transformed Pandora, uh, you know, this whole myth from something that was released into the world into, in other words, it was released by a really small portable object instead of being released by a huge immovable object. And that changed everything. So what Kira and I are curious about exploring with Pandora is when your story has been rewritten by someone else, how can you take charge of that story again? And one of the things that has always bothered me a little bit about the Pandora myth is if by opening it, she let out all of the evils and by closing it, she left hope in the world, well, how can that be? If either you open it and you let the evils and hope out or you close it and mankind doesn't get what's in the box. So we are hoping to take this forward and turn it into Pandora's real story, which is it releases all good things out into the world. And I think at this time, when we're all going through the pandemic, that is what we need. We need hope out there in the entire world. Um, and so that's what our protagonist, our heroine is going to be doing is coming to the realization that if you want to bring hope to the world, you have to release it out. So that's a, a very long winded answer, but that's what we're hoping to do. Oh, no, actually, thank you. It wasn't, uh, it was a pleasure to listen to and to see all the connections with uh, how females were portrayed and maybe think of Adam and Eve that also Eve was female who was blamed in the story. Um, as regards uh, the performance, I wanted to go obviously to Jonathan and uh, considering your uh, background in Broadway, I know you acted in War Horse and you were performing uh, an actual horse there. So it was interesting for me and for us uh, and, and the audience to know uh, how does it feel to take the, the appearance of something that is otherly than human? So you had the experience of the horse on Broadway and here you're acting as a godly avatar. So how is that? That's a great question. Actually, I think our little rehearsal today taught me something new. Um, when we switched avatars from one that gives me the, the sense of being the same height that I actually am in reality, there's a certain way that the character feels to me. And then when we jump to that larger character, um, you know, and I'm sort of aware that the body of the character is, is not just taller, but just sort of larger, it sort of inspires a different sense of performance, which is really fun to um, uh, put your actor imagination into that given circumstance and to have, um, you know, to be given up an avatar body that sort of helps support that by also being a bit larger than life. Um, and so that's kind of a, a neat thing that I'm discovering with um, with what you can do in VR. And of course you can do it on stage as well. You know, certainly having the puppets that we had in, in War Horse, they were so exquisitely made and, and the rehearsal that we did to really embody them uh, also helped to transform your point of view from your sort of normal everyday self into the characters. Um, but you know, there's there's ways that we can uh, do that technically in VR that are really exciting. And then on a certain level, it, it also is the same process that you go through anytime that you're embodying a character, whether it's another human character 
or an animal or something that's supernatural and that it's really a, it really starts with your imagination and kind of letting that go in interesting places and trusting that all of the technical elements will work as resonators for that. Well, thank you for that. It's very inspirational. I was um, I was wondering. I would like to uh, uh, ask a question also to our lovely director, Kira. Um, how meaningful is it for you to create a liaison between these Greek myths and this new medium? And of course, uh, how do you feel this can have an effect on uh, rereading those myths? Uh, do you feel that in the future? Uh, VR could also be introduced in schools to, to teach these stories and history. Uh, you're pulling from your uh, from your professorial background there, Kiara. Uh, I don't think anyone gave a proper introduction for you, but you know I'll do that quickly now. Um, Kiara is a professor of phenomenology from the understanding of our experiences um, and was also with us as part of our production in Venice uh, for Love Beat. Um, and is also a visible artist herself um, and a writer. So all of these uh, mediums coming together. And yes, I, I think that great stories never go away. It's why we, you know, we keep returning to the stories of Shakespeare. We will continue to return to the great mythological stories because they have the truth in them that we cannot ever forget. I, I think that these are important stories that we learn from as humans and we connect to this deep pain especially in the greek stories you know tremendous sacrifice and and um and and huge epic moments that help us remember why we're here on earth as as humans having these incredible experiences and now we have this ability to take storytelling into this new realm, into this new dimension. I mean, to be able to embody a character or an audience member that could potentially have a role in a production, you know, this is something that we foresee in the future of our work, that we are really bringing the audience in to embody uh, characters, to take elements on, to to play with the story and the narrative, to get to interact more with our actors, um, we're having the opportunity to tell stories in a three-dimensional medium, which is akin to the reality in which we live. And who knows whether there are even other dimensions that we can explore beyond that. So, and I do think that, sure, we can use these for educational purposes and take these stories into classrooms. Um, and I think the beauty right now is that people can be a part of these worlds from their very home, from their the couch in their living rooms. Well, that is terrific to see all the incredible potential VR has in all fields. And especially we can consider it now in lockdown of how many cinema goers are going to be uh, persuaded to explore this magnificent tool. Thank you very much for having me here today to chat with you all about the making of your beautiful stories. And I'll leave it to Matty from Culture Hub and goodbye to you all. Thank you for joining us from Milan and we're sending lots of love over there to your people. Thanks, Kira. That was awesome. Thanks, Maddie. That was an experiment. Totally, totally. Yeah, we're like, we're like yeah, just an open rehearsal. And then we're like, okay, let's try everything. <laughs> Yeah, how many video feeds and how many virtual cameras can we get in there? I um, know. We tried. <laughs> yeah, we got something. I mean, that that was so great. So um, thanks, Kira and Kiara and everybody who participated this afternoon. Um, we've got another open rehearsal tonight, actually, at 8 p.m. We sort of did these two times to get uh, different folks in different time zones um the ability the, the ability to join so if you want to come back at 8 p.m 
we have a new moderator, isn't that right? That's right. We will have Nick Fortuno, a game designer from Playmatics in New York. Great. Um, and Kiara, Kira's team will also be working with us in experiments in digital storytelling for the next month. And we'll have uh, work to share with a virtual audience and a live stream audience um, on May 16th. That is correct. And so yeah. if they want to follow you guys on Culture Hub NYC on Facebook, you guys can subscribe to our newsletter on our double I website, double I.co. And we can be sending you updates. And for those of you with virtual headsets, we definitely want to bring some of you into our VR stage in May. So let us know if you'd like to be in there and we would be welcome to have some of you in there exploring the virtual world with us and watching uh, watching our our actors perform live. Great. Thanks so much, everybody. And thank you for watching uh, and for participating. We'll see uh, on the other side.